Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kelly Foyle, and I work in outreach and education. This is going to be the first of three panel discussions that we're going to have throughout the day. In these sessions, we're going to have a chance to dive a little deeper into a variety of career paths. Our first panel this morning is focused on careers in the private sector. Our panelists are going to share how they got to where they are today, and also some practical tips um, for your own uh, career path. We're fortunate to have four excellent panelists with us this morning, representing a range of specialties and work experience. You'll find them listed in your program, and in just a moment, I'll ask each of them to introduce themselves and share a little bit about their, their own career. I have a list of questions with me today that I'll use to help guide our discussions. The questions are based in part on questions that you submitted when you, when you registered for the event, and also on conversations um, that we've had with you. Um, but you'll also have your, the chance to ask questions directly with the same um, microphones that were used earlier this morning. Um, so at any time that you'd like, I'll call for questions throughout the panel discussion. And Patty, who's here up in the front in the yellow shirt, she'll make sure a microphone gets to you to ask your question. Um, if you see that somebody else has a question too, you can pass the microphone directly on to them. So feel free to um, engage the speakers at any time with questions that you might have. So let's get started. I'm going to ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves and share how they got to where they are now, and also how they made the choice to switch from physics into their chosen career. Alex, let's start with you. is an experimental particle physics rather than a theoretical particle physics. So uh, sort of they're, they're amongst you. Um, so uh, I work as a machine learning researcher at Borealis AI. But before that, I did a five-year postdoc in particle physics, and then before that, a, a PhD um, working in neutrino physics. In terms of how I found myself in machine learning, at some point during my postdoc, really out of uh, my own curiosity, I decided to start learning more about machine learning. Um, and just through sort of uh, a sort of growing background knowledge, I realized there were a few interesting opportunities to do with sort of the emerging field of um, so-called deep learning, just basically the application of uh, deep convolutional neural networks, in particular in computer vision, which turned out to work really well within my own uh, field of particle physics. Um, and that went on for some years. I did more and more sort of like machine learning for particle physics um, that helped my experiments a lot. But at some point, I realized that I wasn't reading particle physics papers anymore. I was really just reading machine learning papers. Uh, and I was much more excited about the latest machine learning research than particle physics. So that sort of was how I sort of woke up one day and realized I wanted to be a machine learning researcher. Uh, we can talk more about the actual process later of making that jump, but that was sort of the, the broad story. Sounds good. Renee? OK. Well, thanks very much. And uh, welcome, everybody, to a career session, which has been now running at least the second time, and it's been really great to see this focus. Um, I would probably say, given the previous talk, I can now probably safely say that I've already followed a very traditional physics career path in the sense that I was very, very focused on physics and moving in physics. I did uh, my PhD in quantum computing um, starting around 2000 when quantum computing and quantum information processing got really excited as a brand new field. Uh, really took off with a lot of re really exciting discoveries. Um, did two postdocs after that uh, in Calgary and uh, at U of T. And the field has quieted, uh, quieted down quite a bit. Um, academic positions were are pretty scarce. Uh, there weren't really a lot of positions available. And I really needed to find kind of a new direction. Uh, and so it took a bit of a while to kind of get into that direction. I can talk about that a bit later. But uh, the financial crisis happened. And that kind of gave me a lot of motivation to kind of get a bit of an understanding about, wow, this is actually something that, first of all, physicists moved in traditionally in the past. Um, they might have been responsible for part of the financial crisis. And I wanted to understand a bit how that happened, why it happened, and how also regulations and how the financial system is shaped. Uh, and so that's how I kind of motivated myself to move into finance and got started in 2009 at Scotiabank and have been moving through various teams at Scotiabank. Um, through model validation, model development, so a lot of technology projects that I've been involved in, and now running a team of about 30 quants in the space, uh, a lot of them with uh, physics, engineering, science, uh, IT backgrounds. So 
very exciting time and journey. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, I should confess I was also an experimentalist. Um, but unlike my colleagues here, I, I did not continue to the PhD level. I started on that very traditional path that we all heard about this morning. And when I got to the end of my master's degree at U of T, I thought, what I'm doing right now, I don't want a PhD in. And going back to one of the questions from earlier, uh, they had this great program at the time where they said, you can put your scholarship on hold. We'll take care of the money for you. You can go out, you can work for a year, and then come back. And I said, oh, OK, that's great. I'll go figure out what I want to do. And uh, so since I didn't intend it to be a career, I thought, I just need to find a job to do while I figure out what I want to do in physics. So in a way, it was the complete opposite of the whole intentional think through what you want to do that we heard that you should plan. But it allowed me to fall into something that I really did like. Uh, my sister-in-law was working at CP Rail, and they liked to hire physicists because they said, nobody knows our systems. They're proprietary. Whoever comes in will have to learn them. We know physicists can learn. So that was true. I lived that. And I went into their computers and communications department, which is what they probably now would call IT and software development, something like that. Worked there for a year. It was pretty interesting. And uh, then the university called back and said, would you like to come back? And I said, uh, I'm not too sure. And they said, we'll hold your money for another year. I said, OK, I'll work for another year. And when they called back the next time, I said, you know what, give the money to somebody else because I'm having a good time over here in industry. So uh, after that, I moved from a company of 20,000 employees, CP Rail, to a company in Waterloo of 20 employees, uh, which was a little more physics related in that they did 3D measurement systems. And uh, being 20 people, you got to play with firmware, with hardware. You picked up the phone for sales calls. Um, and that was very interesting and always moving basically in the R&D software space. Later, I tried very briefly a uh, startup with some friends, discovered that we weren't really suited to that. Tried independent contracting for one contract, and I went, I don't like that. Um, but I did work with a small contracting company, which allowed me to work with a lot of different customers, clients, types of uh, work. And then I ended up at OpenText, which is about 13,000 employees around the world right now. It's one of the biggest software companies you've never heard of. And we make enterprise level software. And the position I'm in right now, they actually came looking for me because again, they said, physicists can figure stuff out. They can uh, bridge the gaps between groups, again, as we heard. And although nobody ever told me these things when I was in physics, they all turned out to be completely true, and I really wish I'd heard this morning's talk 25 years ago. Um, but uh, right now I work in a group, it's called Technical Marketing, which means we take all the shiny, new, fresh off the presses, giant pieces of software and try to figure out interesting things to do with them and help the people in the field um, figure out how to solve real world problems with the various products that we have. Um, and I get to do interesting things with nice people every day. So that's my story. That sounds good. Natasha? Uh, hi, everyone. It's great to be back here. I don't have any confessions to make. I was actually a theoretical physicist. I did my master's here in 2012. I joined the PSI program. And after that, I also completed my PhD here at PI under the supervision of Nyaya Shafshordi and Robert Mann. Uh, my research was focused on cosmology and gravitational physics. But then around maybe the third year of my PhD, I was kind of thinking what I was going to do after my PhD. Of course, at that time, the postdoc was kind of the first priority, maybe the only choice I was considering. But the more I talked to people, not only postdocs, but people that also um, have taken other career paths, I realized that there were many opportunities I could pursue. So I started like, doing a bigger research on all the possibilities. And at that time, I was thinking, I want to do something that is related to talking to people, like interacting to people way more than I was doing <coughs> during my PhD. Um, so I started preparing myself for the interviews and doing a lot of networking with people that I knew. 
And it turns out that after um, my PhD, I was accepted to join the INSIGHT data science program. So this is a seven week uh, program that helps academics transition to a career in industry. And that experience was great. I think it was three things that really impacted me by doing that program. The first part was uh, the network that they allow me to see. So you get exposed to a lot of different companies in the Toronto area that are hiring people with PhD skills. Um, so I get to know people, well, visit Borealis when I was there. I also visited like um, a bunch of startups and then financial institutions as well. And one of the companies that was there is called Birch Hill. So I interviewed with them and I got offered a job. So what we do at Birch Hill is we invest money in, in small companies, Canadian companies, and we try to manage them for like seven or two, 10 years and then sell them. And I work there as a data scientist. So what I do on my, on my day to day is think about the machine learning uh, projects that these companies can use for to, to generate more money or to, to behave better with the people that they serve. Um, I was, I'm really happy, I'm really enjoying it there right now. And I'm happy to share more about it after. Awesome, thank you. Um, so let's start off by talking about some of the skills uh, that you might need to make the transition um, from physics to um, a career in the private sector. What skills um, did you think maybe you were missing or do you see in uh, physics students? Renee, do you wanna tackle that question? I can start out with that. Certainly, I think the skill set kind of changes a little bit through time and through your career in the industry that you might be taking. Uh, as I said, I moved into finance about 2009, so certainly the skill set has, and the requirement has changed quite a bit of, over time. Um, when I started it out, I think probably the most immediate skill sets that you need is really, um, well, pretty much all of the skills that everybody already has is the problem solving uh, kind of side. But more practically speaking, in many, many of the applications, whether it's AI machine learning, whether it's financial modeling, computational, um, having exposure to a programming language, having, for example, worked with simulating uh, real world systems, um, having done a lot of simulations, having a lot of, done a lot of data analytics, that has been very, mu very much important. Uh, my background also, in a sense, I started out in experimental optics, I moved into theoretic physics, but I always stayed fairly close to modeling of real world systems. And so that certainly helped a lot when I transitioned first into finance, because you really had kind of the skill set that you needed to really work with kind of real world systems and had a lot of the computational background also and the development background um, that was needed for that. Um, I think would say after that, I think the skill, the skill set changes quite dramatically um, as you're taking on either management of projects, management of people, uh, leadership, um, running a team of 30 people is quite different from uh, doing day-to-day -day programming and building day-to-day -day processes. So that's quite a different skill sets that you'll need over time. And as you progress in a different career, you pro certainly will look towards those uh, items. I think from the start, though, communication, um, working with interdisciplinary teams, so everything that we've heard, heard in the previous talk is certainly pretty much spot on in terms of the skill sets that is needed. Um, being able to like interact and collaborate with many, many different teams, um, kind, kind of expressing your ideas in very simple um, kind of, um, I uh, like in, in simple kind of like expressions or basically simple short uh, sentences to kind of discuss it also with more senior people that might not be as familiar with, with the very technical area that you're in. Those are all skill sets that are very, very critical. And I think then as you progress more, some of the management and some of the kind of leadership skills that go along with that. Natasha, having just sort of made the transition recently, what are some of the, the, the skills that you feel like maybe you've had to grapple with in so, a short time? Yeah, no, first of all, I wanna say that in my experience, when I transition and also being a part of Inside that you communicate with different mini PhDs of all um, areas, I actually think the PhD in physics and the physics education is actually very well-rounded. We have a lot of skills and we're not afraid about mathematics, and this is something that many people would think that's an asset. Like we can actually, we have the skills of solving a big problem, being able to concentrate, focus, like break that problem in small chunks and actually deliver things. That I think is positive. So in my opinion, I think 
a physicist is actually sitting on a, on a gold mine of having a lot of skills and that are very useful and very transferable. But kind of adding to Renes, I think the only thing you have to do is once you figure out like maybe the industries that you're interested in, what are the topics or the, the focus that that industry um, are working on and kind of sharpen on, on those skills. So for example, when I decided to show, join data, um, data science, I want to be a data scientist. I took a bunch of courses of machine learning and deep learning and tried to learn those skills and try to actually apply them to a real problem. So actually build a machine learning algorithm that solve a problem end to end and that give me the experience and the skills that I was actually being able to deliver a project. And the second thing I will add, at least for an entry level position, and this thing that's been more challenging for me is that when you're working for a company, you don't have to solve 100% of the problem. Like maybe 80% of that problem, as fast as you can, is already a good deliverable. And that is something I've been struggling on, like from a PhD mindset that you have to have your paper 100% ready before you actually send it to a journal, to now when you have to deliver something in a timeline and you don't have time to do that 100%, maybe do 80% that will get you going, that's the skill that I've been struggling the most, I guess, as of now. And to add on Rene point as well, like communication skills, being able to work with a team, not being isolated is something that I will encourage you to, to start practicing as well. Sounds good. We had a question that was uh, focused on AI. So someone asked, you know, while they were a student pursuing their degree, what is something they could uh, practice or what are some things they could take on to perhaps prepare them for such a job? Alex, would you feel comfortable doing that? Yeah, I'm very happy to. So um, I think there are a lot of online resources now which are fantastic. So I, when I first got started, there was basically just Coursera and that was great, but there are a great many out there now. Um, but the thing that you should always remember, I would say, um, and I see is like the one failure mode of this is don't just watch the videos or the lectures and be like, I understand like the simple maths behind back propagation, I don't really need to go apply this stuff. Like actually go out, do the exercises, find a project ideally. I think that's a really good idea. Like ideally, maybe like you can find maybe a nice complicated Kaggle project. A lot of them are very trivial, but some of them are really good and have like a lot of depth to them. Um, C is just a great way to get a free data set. Don't worry too much about competing up the Kaggle board or stuff like that. Because a lot of what they'll do to hack a good result isn't necessarily what you'd really do in a company anyway. But um, yeah, I would say like do the exercises, for one of these courses, find a big project, and put it up on GitHub um, at the end of the day. So you have a nice, ideally cleanly coded uh, example project that shows that you know how to take a machine learning project from idea to execution. Sounds great. Do we have any questions from the audience on skills or skills related questions? None yet? Okay. Um, just make, make sure you make yourself known to someone up here in the front if there's questions at any time. Maybe let's turn to finding a job. Um, what's a tip that maybe you would have for finding a company that's good for, to work for, that has good work culture? Margaret, do you want to take a stab at that one? Um, sure. I think a lot of, again, what we heard this morning in the earlier session is extremely applicable. Talk to everyone. Talk to your contacts at school, but talk to the person that's sitting next to you at the movie theater. Talk to your mother's friends. You know, talk to your dad's golf buddies. Talk to your mom's golf buddies. Talk to the person at the dog park. Um, one of my jobs I literally got by somebody I was chatting with at the dog park, and she said, you know something about computers, don't you? Um, we're looking for somebody in my team. Would you be interested? <laughs> I was walking my dog. <laughs> it just so happened that at that time in my life, I, I was employed, but I was getting uh, ready to move on. I was tired of where I was working for various reasons. And I thought, OK, I will go find out about this opportunity because I was walking my dog. So you never know. But it is also very key to uh, communicate clearly, to have that 30-second pitch of who you are in plain language, as they say, as your grandmother or grandfather could understand. And to your point, Alex, that we need to see 
not just that you can do the math, that you can do the programming, but you want to have something tangible that you can then pass on to say, and look, here's an example of what I did. So you, when, that, when that conversation goes on, you can say, well, I can show you something. Mm -hmm. I can show you an example. I can prove it. Um, not, don't just take my word for it or somebody's word for it that physicists are great because a lot of people go, ooh, physicists. I, I don't know. They're kind of scary. I, I don't understand them. I mean, how many times have you heard, oh, you're in physics? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. so talk to everybody, network like crazy, um, but do it organically. And in terms of, like, it sounds like in your path, you've gone from, you know, having worked at a big company versus a smaller startup, having contracts. You, I think sometimes people have the impression that the private sector, it's super cutthroat, that there's going to be, you know, you're going to be working all through the night. Is that, is that true? Or is that a myth? Um, um, is there some places that are like that, others not? There's, in my experience, it is a huge variation. And if you are, again, as mentioned this morning, if, if you, what you want is 8.30 to 5, you can find that. Chances are you're never going to find something where you always get to leave at 5 o'clock. At least I wouldn't, because sometimes you're just doing something that's so interesting that you don't want to. You, is, if you're doing something that's interesting, you look up and you go, oh, it's 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> but that's because you wanted to, not because somebody said you had to. Every now and then, you're probably going to have to, because real world, you have to deliver something. Uh, but no, um, you, there are many, many different environments. And what's good for one person will not be good for another person. You have to be willing to accept that you might not know or what your friend recommended or what that person you met at the dog park recommended and is great for them isn't great for you. But you might not know that till you get there. But no, it's not super cutthroat. It's not always work through the night. You can have what fits for you. Does anybody have something they'd like to add to that? Or? I would probably echo one, some of the comments also, in particular, talking to people, um, getting to basically talk to physicists that have moved into that area and also into that company and kind of getting a feel of how they're working, what their feel is for the company, how the feel is for specific teams. There's many, many different teams throughout most of the companies. They have very, very different focus areas and also very different kind of like work styles as well. And when I moved first into finance, I was certainly um, a little bit like not worried to some, certainly worried in a sense, basically moving into a corporate environment, working, moving into a very uh, competitive and a cutthroat area in a sense. But I actually found kind of, kind of the opposite to be true. It was, in a sense, within all of the teams, much, much more collaborative. There was a lot of collaborations between different teams within the team, working on kind of on common goals. And even working across different financial institutions, for example, I had the opportunity to provide uh, feedback on new financial regulations at some point. And pretty much everybody was working very collaborative together to come up with a better solution for the industry and providing feedback and working, working together. So it's not necessarily always quite true that the environment kind of, like there's a lot of preconception about what the environment might be of certain companies. And I think, especially moving into finance, I found it actually quite the opposite to be true. And I think the best way to find out is to talk to people uh, and kind of get that feel. Uh, I think the second point I would probably make is you have to know yourself, uh, know your strengths, what you enjoy, um, what your passion is. And in a sense, I think most of us probably have moved into physics because that was really what our passion was. I decided in high school I was going to move into physics. So finding something that uh, kind of echoed that was kind of really challenging and difficult. And uh, for me, the financial crisis and kind of seeing how regulations can sh shape the financial industry, uh, how risk is managed going forward, how the industry is changing, is going to be changing over the next five to 10 years. That was really something that got really me excited. It was a new and exciting field, a lot of opportunity for change. And I had the opportunity then also, my kind of role was within the bank actually was shaped because people knew I was interested in that and I was given the opportunity to work in that. And uh, a lot of times your, the role that you're taking can be shaped by your interests and by your passions and what you're interested in. And so I was, for example, provided with the opportunity to provide feedback on a financial regulation that is now taking effect internationally. 
and we had a very major stake in shaping that. So know your passion, know what you're, what you're enjoying. For example, if you want to have an impact, for example, on a particular area, if that's your key driver, there's many, many different areas where you can have that. And in industry, pretty much as much so as you can in academic and realizing that about yourself. And then realizing that the company that you're going to will kind of support that passion and will provide the right environment. And you can get that best through talking to people, talking to peers, talking to people that have taken that step. Just to follow up on that quickly, uh, I think one thing to, to realize quickly is people are actually super friendly when you ask them to talk about their field or their experiences having left physics. So, you'll probably feel bad at first, like wasting this important person's time by sending them an email or something. But as long as you're very nice and you're very grateful, I think you'll usually find they're incredibly receptive. You know, that one person you met at a workshop that now works at DeepMind will like spend half an hour talking to you on the phone and like uh, send you detailed comments on your resume. Like, it's okay to rely on the kindness of almost to strangers, the dog park strangers, right? Um, so uh, I just, just encourage you to take those little chances because um, really most people out there are really very nice and they want to help and they remember what it was like to make that first leap outside of physics. So is it true that lots of jobs are unadvertised? Is it, you know, is it such that one ought to be circulating the dog park or like <laughs> <laughs> asking people about work? You know? <laughs> is that, what advice would you give to someone? Is it... You know, should they be looking beyond the boards? You, many people mention talking to others, but is there, you know, how do you get started in, in that? Tasha, do you want to? I guess uh, you tried the insight. Uh, yeah, for uh, me, uh, but even before insight, I think most of the jobs I was uh, looking at were actually in Glass or on LinkedIn. However, I found those to be, uh, in all honesty, a little bit pre-made, like people need someone, they will just fill in a class or a LinkedIn opportunity or even a website in their, in their, in their own personal like, company website and they put that they need someone. And you can like, scroll through those and see what the opportunities are. However, I find that talking to people one-on-one -on -one is the best way to, to know what's available and to know what actually the job entails. Sometimes companies will say, I need this person. I want this person to be a genius, all these different <laughs> sets of skills, and you get like, I don't want to apply to that. I, I am not even half of that. But then talking to the company, you realize that their needs perhaps are others. Um, so for me, getting to know people, that people can tell you exactly the, the kind of skills they're looking for, uh, is the best way to, to actually see what the opportunities are available. So coming back to networking, I think networking is a really important part of it, like maintaining uh, those relationships active, like talking to people, like second what Alex said, people are actually super friendly. Everybody wants you to succeed. I, and I've seen that at every step, like here at PI, when I was like talking to a lot of people here, they super helped me con like expand my network, then an insight. And then now after, like you become like a li wanted LinkedIn person. Everybody wants to say, wants to like ask for your advice, and I encourage you to do that. Like get out of your, like maybe being scared of talking to a stranger and and asking for feedback and asking what are what are the jobs available. And in my personal experience, there's no shortage of work, at least that a physicist can do. That's an excellent point, though. That it is scary. Um, cold calling is scary. It's, it's not really cold calling. It's slightly faintly warm calling if you're calling a contact of a contact because somebody said, oh, you're, you're looking. You're graduating. You're going to be looking for a job. Have you talked to so-and-so at such and such a company? It's scary, but you're right. They don't mind. I mean, most of them. And if there is that outlier who says, how'd you get my name? Why are you calling me? That's okay, move on. You know what, but most people are very happy to talk to you, but you do have to reach out. You, you do have to send that message, send that email, or pick up the phone. And it's scary, but you can do it. Questions? Yes, yeah? Also, I agree, and if you do it once and they don't respond, don't think it's because they hate you, right? <laughs> Just very good advice. 
Yeah, so are there questions about uh, looking for jobs or... Yeah, I see a hand up there. Patty's going to toss our microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, some of you, I think, have formal credentials in the field you're working in. The inside, and really, I think you have an MBA, is that right? Yeah. Um, so, well, what's your, do you have any advice on that? Is that something good to go after, like a formal credential? So, so I would say I did the MBA during the first three years parallel when I started in finance. Uh, so I pretty much started on the exact same day that I moved into finance. I started the MBA program, and I did it part-time as a morning program uh, just before going to work, which is kind of interesting. Um, it, I would say it wasn't really required to move into the field. And as I said, I actually started on the same day, pretty much. What it, what it brought with it was a bit the commitment to move into finance and risk management and kind of prove that commitment, mm. because I was so kind of committed to physics that Actually, when I first interviewed, I didn't get the first time the position because there's, this was a physicist. This is, he might not be interested actually in, or staying in finance. So uh, it kind of proved that commitment. Um, more actually for me, actually, I would say it really kind of like helped with the skill sets basically that I think for non-academic careers and, and even I think academic careers actually are in a sense needed. Uh, in a sense, some of, the, some of the business background, some of the management background, some of the leadership skills, um, the networking skills is really what kind of that program focused on. And I really enjoyed that part, most of it. And pretty much when I first basically kind of approached this was, I, I thought, well, why do an MBA or why do a degree like that? Because you can pretty much learn all of that by yourself. Like, if it's the risk management part, if it's the finance part, you can pretty much pick up a book and read that. Well, you can't do that with the management skills, with the leadership skills, with the networking skills, and getting to meet people. Um, it's also worth saying is really that um, the people that I met in that, in that program were, had very, very varied backgrounds. I would probably say half of them uh, were actually interested in start, building a startup company in entrepreneurship directions. Um, some of them basically were interested in science policy directions. Uh, some people were interested in moving into finance, risk management. But it was a very, very varied group of people, and it was really kind of a very great environment to kind of build those additional skill sets. So I would say it's not absolutely necessarily necessary to kind of do those kind of certifications. The certifications and kind of the additional degrees that you take, they do show a commitment. They kind of maybe might help you in the future. Um, in some ways, but it's not absolutely necessary to get started. I think to get started, I think pretty much everybody here in the room, uh, for most of the fields that we're talking about, you can pretty much get started immediately. I, I think it's getting a bit more difficult, more potentially on the machine learning side, also finance side. You probably want to pick up a book and you want to understand it, but um, you pretty much have most of the skill sets to get started immediately. I, th I think one point too, if we look back at the, again at the first talk where we heard about the 80% of applications that never make it to a human. So if you do have any kind of additional qualifications, yes, you can program. We all know you can program. But the computer in the HR department doesn't know that physics means you can use a computer. So if you have you know, any kind of online course, if you took a night school class at a college, anything that actually puts it in writing, that that filter will recognize as, oh, okay, let it through to the human, that's one place where it can help also, is it gets you through that 80% filter so that somebody can look at you and see how awesome you are. So maybe build, building on that, like in terms of the resume, what is a tip, or I'm obviously writing the right things for the computer code, but getting your resume to the right person, um, what are, some advice that you might give for including. Um, Renee, do you want to? Well, I, I would probably yeah. say, I think it's exactly uh, what Margaret said. I think you want to basically highlight the skill sets that will be needed for the particular role. Um, so, for example, just listing even some of the programming languages uh, that you've been exposed to, in some cases actually even kind of explaining how much code you might have written in terms of lines, in terms of uh, like kind of the size, might actually help 
in terms of basically pushing the resume a little bit further to the top and say, okay, this person is exactly the right, uh, the right fit. Uh, I would probably also say when you're structuring, there's a lot of good examples of resumes obviously on, on, on the internet. Uh, you want to really focus not so much on uh, basically kind of like the education is, is, is to some extent important. Uh, you, you have all of that, but also the projects that you've worked on and the impact that you've had in a particular area and in particular, the skill sets that you've developed along with that, and highlighting that pretty much up front so that it's immediately picked up uh, when it actually goes through, let's say, a more like a, a regular HR channel. Um, that's very important. Um, I think the best way to get around the filtering is the networking. Mm -hmm. yes, absolutely. Uh, in the sense, basically, is if you already uh, if you already know somebody within the within within the company or within the institution that you'd like to get uh, get into. Um, if somebody knows you're looking, there's a good chance that your resume kind of bypasses that and already lands on somebody's desk mm -hmm. um, for a position. And the, the other thing is, sometimes you might just interview for a position and it might not work out. There is another role that comes up that might be better fitted half a year later. And we share internally resumes pretty much across a wide, wide range of teams. And we try to kind of match the role or the person to the role and the role to the person. <laughs> Like it's both sides. Like it has, and we, we have a team of about 30 people. Um, that has a fairly wide variety of skill sets. And you can take a look at, okay, this person might be really a good fit for this role. When you're applying, you might not get the job at this time, but maybe three months later, six months later, another, another role comes up that is better fitted. And it works out then. Just to follow up on some of that, I feel one little thing that a lot of people struggle with when they're leaving academia is translating their achievements from sort of their domain speak into something that someone in the wider world in industry might understand. So if you have a, a good friend that can help you and explain if the sentence you wrote makes sense to someone who's not a domain expert in your field and actually sounds uh, comprehensible and impressive to somebody in the field you're interested in, that's really good. Um, and, and just to follow up on the uh, uh, getting a recommendation, that's always great. Um, the higher up in the company, the better. A lot of companies um, like um, Google or Amazon, it won't redirect straight past HR. If it's a lower level recommendation, it will just get sort of mark earmarked as it goes through the HR department. So if you know you have a more distant connection who's higher up the food chain, you might consider reaching out to them just in case they're willing to recommend you because uh, that's more likely to go straight to someone's desk. Um, obviously that varies a lot from company to company, but it's just something to think about. And one extra thing I will also add is that it's very hard to condense like maybe 10 years of academic experience into just one page, uh, but you have to make your great effort. Like when, when we are reading resumes of people that apply to positions here, there's like hundreds of resumes and it's really hard to actually get all that information in your head. So try to be very concise. Don't use the application to the job that you are very excited as the first time your resume gets seen. Like pass it around, have it seen by a lot of eyes before you actually uh, send it through if this is like a very, very important job that you want to apply. And the second thing is the details that you might find important might not be important for, for the company. So bear this in mind. Your resume has to be very clear and it's kind of, I have to understand what you've done in kind of 10 seconds of like skimming through, through the page. And this is a skill that is more an art than a skill, but the way to get better at it is making your resume being seen by as, many, as much people as possible. And that first pass is gonna hurt. Yes, <laughs> yes. very much. And you shouldn't have one resume. That's true. Mm. You, it's painful and you'll hate it. But once you've written it and crafted it and passed it to all your buddies and looked at it, you're not done. You, if you really want to get a certain job, you're going to have to tweak that resume for pretty much everything you apply to, to inc if you want to increase your chances. So um, it's, it's not fun, but it's <laughs> worth it. Other questions maybe on interviewing? And, uh, oh, sorry, resumes? Could you pass that over? No one wants to throw it. <laughs> Hi. So how long does it actually take to get a job? 
How long? How long? How long does it take to get We're a job? We're talking weeks, months, years. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's kind of perennial how long is a piece of string question. I, I think a lot of it depends on when you start, how clear an idea you have of what you want to do. I, I know that when I started, I didn't really understand the difference between a machine learning researcher and a machine learning engineer. So I spent a lot of time interviewing for machine learning engineer jobs, which are much more common, before realizing I really didn't want to do that. I wanted to be a researcher still. Um, but maybe if you came out the gate and like you knew that you wanted to go straight to finance and you've been preparing for some time, maybe it would be faster. I don't know. I think you need to be prepared for a lot of rejection and just sending a lot of applications, uh, particularly that first like jump out the gate. Um, uh, maybe this should have came up earlier, but uh, uh, one thing I did was just to send out lots of applications. Um, and to get past this idea of like, I don't know, in academia, you apply to maybe like a half dozen universities for a tenure track position or something like that, um, which have openings. Now you're applying to like the 100 jobs in North America <laughs> that match the field that you're interested in. Um, maybe you don't actually want to work at all of them, but they'll probably be great experience at interviewing and uh, tweaking resumes and getting feedback. And uh, yeah, you should also ask for feedback, I would say, after a failed interview. Um, they're unlikely to give it, but if they do, it's useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, also we'll add that finding a job is not begging someone to give you a job. It's you actually finding a company that you will be happy working as well. So this is a two-sided uh, kind of process that you have to do. You apply to a lot of things that you find interesting, but maybe none of them actually caught your attention after you interview, so you go again. My kind of advice will do not accept the first thing just because it's the first thing and you're just like, oh, I find a job, I'm done. Like, actually think this is a two-way process that whenever someone interview, you're also interviewing them, and you also want to be working on some place that you feel comfortable about. So it can take you, like, I don't know, six months to find that place that you're happy with, or a year. Don't be too picky either, but there is always a balance. Don't accept the first like job because it's the first job, because you probably don't know the culture, if you'd be happy there or not. But also don't feel that you will that this is a process that might take you two years. I think if you were prepared, if you've done your networking, if you know what you want to be doing, you like everybody in this room has high chances of finding a job. Good. So let's turn maybe to um, interviews. Let's say you've gotten your resume to the right person. What is the, the top tip for uh, nailing your interview? Um, Renee, do you want to start with that one? I think the first one is do your research about who you're applying with, uh, the people that interview you. Sometimes you get to know the people that might be interviewing you, you might get the names. Take a look at their background. Uh, that already tells you quite a lot about what they might ask, whether they're gonna be on the kind of the right wavelength. If it's, a, if it's, if it, if it's somebody who has a physics background who's interviewing you, it's gonna be a lot easier than if the first interview is somebody from HR or from a more general department. And so you want to do your research about the particular, the people, the job, the skill sets, and what is kind of typical for that kind of an interview. Um, finance, a lot of the interviews are, depending on which area, if you're moving more into a computational IT area, it's where it might be programming questions that you might be asked. Uh, if it's uh, uh, risk management and related to derivatives, it's, uh, it might be problem solving questions, it might be puzzles, it might be finance questions. Uh, if you're moving into a more general role, it might be uh, even kind of like general economics background and kind of your interest basically in that area. Do your research about the particular role, about what, and find out what, uh, what questions people have asked and who's interviewing you and the particular role that they're looking for. Find out as much as possible. Natasha, did you wanna add anything? Yeah, first of all, I like, super agree with that. Coming back to networking, and I don't want to be insistent, but talking to people that already had an interview with our organization can help you a ton. Like, you know what they're gonna ask you. You know, um, not exactly the question, but kind of the spirits of the question. Um, if you do your research, you also know what projects the group might be working on, um, what are the interests of that group, and you can be better prepared to kind of gear your answers to be aligned to, to whatever environment they're, they're working on. I will also say that doing your research will help you ask questions at the end. And please, 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 when you do an interview, have questions to ask them because this shows that you're interested in them. 
uh, this shows that you're excited to work with them. If you, if at the end of an interview you ask, do you have any questions for me? And the person says no, then you might feel like, then you're not really interested in me. If you have nothing to learn from me. So I will say that. And second of all, don't underestimate um, your fluently at talking when you're in an interview. So be prepared to have your answers ready, in particular the answers about yourself. People are gonna ask you, like, tell me about yourself. This is the first question always. Have that answer like grasped to perfection. Do not memorize it, but like know what you wanna say because being nervous can always like be super tricky. And this is an important part. It's like your 20, 30 minutes that you have to expose yourself um, and they will decide if they're gonna give you the job or not. And I think, I suspect that people make decisions in interviews based off like how you feel with the other person. Yeah, you can have the skills, you can be a genius, but if I don't feel like I can work with you, I will probably not hire you. So try to engage with them as much as you can as well during the interview process and be excited about being there. Last point, uh, you're also interviewing them. Uh, you also wanna know how they behave with you. Do you feel comfortable with them? If there is something that is like a red flag, try to follow up on that red flag. Don't stay, don't, do not like accept a job if you have a, a lot of red flags because you might have a, a bad time after. Those are my, my tips. Maybe building on that, um, you know, you mentioned not uh, asking questions at the end. What are some o other common mistakes that people make in interviews? Margaret, did you want to? Um, I think one of them would be not picking up on Alex's excellent suggestion of get as many interviews as you can because it's difficult. You're going to be nervous. You're going to make mistakes. You don't want the well, it might, maybe you'll luck out and the first interview you ever get will be with your dream job and it will go perfectly and you'll get it and you'll have your job in two and a half days. But that probably won't happen. It might, sometimes it does. So the, the start of looking to the having the job offer could take two weeks. It probably won't, but it could. So if that happens, don't turn it down just because you, know, you won the lottery. Because uh, there is a certain amount of luck involved. Um, but people not doing the research, people answering with a pat answer and then stopping, I would say is a big question. Breathe, think about what they asked you, give an answer that you have prepared but that's not canned. Um, you know, you can go through all those online resources that say here are the 50 most common interview questions. If somebody asks you what kind of a tree you wanna be, you probably don't want to work there. Like, just <laughs> don't. <laughs> that means that they are stuck back in some hippy-dippy 60s time, and you probably don't want to work there. They're not going to ask that. But um, stop, think about what they asked, have examples to back up your skills to say, yes, I have solved a difficult problem. Yes, here's a time when I hit a wall, when plan A didn't work, Here's how I adapted. Have examples to back up your answers to the questions because it is a two-way street. They want somebody who will fill a need they have. They're not doing you a favor by hiring you, right? They need something done. So you're not begging for a job, but this is your chance to show them that you can do what they want. So expand, breathe, Think about it while you're, you're answering and do your research ahead. Don't walk in cold, that's what I would say. Um, I think uh, there are a couple of things that come to mind. One of them, which almost goes without saying, but um, you should be prepared to ace any technical part of the interview. So um, for example, you, everyone knows how to program in physics, but do you know how to do a coding interview? Uh, probably not. Um, it's a very specific type of coding, which you would have done if you taken some computer science courses in undergrad perhaps, but even then, not for a very long time. So practice those questions. They're actually pretty easy once you practice them, but it's sort of homework you have to set for yourself. Um, I know I was doing sort of three coding questions a day um, when I was interviewing, just to keep my skills sharp. And That's I a good point, yeah. Really recommend spending time on that. Um, like it doesn't matter how great you do in the sort of the um, sort of the background, sort of uh, softer part of the interview, if you've totally flunk the tentacle, unfortunately, uh, you're unlikely to make it to a next step. But uh, 
Um, I would say don't panic if you forget the semicolon. Yeah, it's, you know, so show, yeah, you should... Show them how you would approach it, even if you forget. Or if you <laughs> forget some really basic machine learning concept, try and like recover, um, just be like, uh, would you mind explaining this part to me? I can't quite remember. Or that's really cool and interesting. I don't think I've come across this concept before. And turn it into a, a, a dialogue. Uh, and often that is totally enough yeah. to, to save that situation. One of the big things they're always looking for is not just that you can answer the question, but that you can work well in a team. So they want to see that as you're solving the problem, you can communicate about the problem. So, you know, it's not just enough. You don't want to just like sit there, hack out this perfect, elegant, totally unreadable solution to some coding problem. You want to like have a dialogue, make sure you really understand exactly what they're asking for before you get started instead of coding up the solution to actually the wrong problem. Um, all these little things, I think, um, are worth spending some time on thinking about. Uh, yeah, and I, I, this question of like really knowing the company, I think, is so important. I, I love seeing that someone's enthusiastic and has good questions about Borealis, and that goes a, a very long way. And I think it's very easy for um, you to maybe like jump into an interview without having warmed yourself up and reminded yourself why you were excited about that company. But if you can find that uh, before you have the interview, that will go a really long way. I would, uh, sorry. You, you talked about preparing for questions for the coding interview. Is there uh, resources to find and prepare those online? Yeah, there are tons. Um, they're really good. I think I particularly recommend the ones which allow you to turn off the, um, the usual like coding environment help hints and stuff like that. Because particularly if you're, um, most companies when they do a coding interview, they'll put you into some version of a text editor. So you won't have all the usual sort of hints and autocompletes and stuff like that. So it's good to um, have something which can run maybe like a bunch of different languages, like Java and Python and C++. Um, actually, just circling back earlier, we talked a little bit about like um, coding backgrounds. Often, probably the programming language you know in physics might not be the one you want for the field that you're moving into. So that's another thing to consider. Maybe when you're doing these coding interview challenges, consider doing them in a language you're not familiar with as a way to learn it. So maybe that's your way into Python, is to do one of these online um, websites. And um, oh, I should say most of them are free. Uh, they'll charge you to have access to the special Amazon or Google uh, interview list. Uh, and maybe you want to pay for that for a month just to see what they look like. But broadly, the free versions are really good. Um, I wish I could remember the names of them, but there are many of them out there now. And they're all really quite good. Uh, and you should consider buying. Um, there's a big green book of coding interview questions. Yeah. You'll probably never be asked a question from that book because everybody knows them, but you should start from that. Like you, if anyone asks you a question from that book, you should be able to answer it very easily. Um, can you remember what the name was? Hacking the coding interview. Something like that, yeah. yeah. It's a green, thick book. Yeah, it's great. Highly recommended. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, Tibra. I, I just had more of a comment than a Sorry. question, um, just to sort of follow up with that. Um, if you feel like the rest of your interview went really well, or relatively well anyways, and there was one specific area that you blanked or you froze and you didn't give the correct technical response, it's a good idea if you know you were just nervous in the moment um, to maybe follow up with them after the fact and, and provide that answer that you couldn't do on the spot via email or through a call after the fact. If it was something minor, if it was one specific thing and you remember after the fact, it shows um, diligence and wherewithal to follow up and it can, and it can be quite indicative that you have um, follow through and uh, good communication skills as well, and, and it, it sets your intention that um, you you really care and you're not a lazy person, and and you even if you don't know something in the moment, you're willing to figure it out and come back with the correct response. That can be um, something that's that's good to show a potential employer as well. Uh, so, so I'm, I, I taught. I've been teaching for the last fifteen years. So. Um, Suppose I decide to, say, quit academia and go into industry or something like that. Like, uh, I would be typically older than the average applicants that, or the average age, say, in this room. So as people who are on the hiring committee, how do you view, like, so, say, somebody who is, say, thinking of making the switch at a later stage in life 
as opposed to somebody who is just fresh out of their first postdoc or their PhD? Oh, it's probably a very personal question, actually. I, I, I know if I often um, have a lot of respect for people who have a lot of experience in another field, but um, you still, like everyone else, have to like prove your sort of like you have everything you need to get started in whatever the, the new job is. Um, so I don't think, I know, but I suspect that varies a lot by domain and by even the individual person interviewing. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Anybody that wants to? I was gonna say, I think we should start by saying that uh, obviously no company is legally allowed to discriminate based on that, at least they shouldn't. Um, well, legally they can't, Realistically, you may feel, uh, I mean, you're young, so it's not gonna make a difference, but later on you may uh, encounter issues. I would say in many ways you have an advantage because they know that as a more mature applicant, you ha assuming again that you have the technical side covered, they know that you have already got that experience, that life experience of dealing with other people, of knowing yourself, of understanding what you're really looking for, whereas a fresh grad is still feeling out the world. Um, so in, in many ways, a, a lot of companies are probably going to look at you quite favorably compared to uh, a brand new, fresh out of school grad, I would think. I would also agree, agree with that uh, uh, like very highly, I think. Um, I think that the age and kind of the experience doesn't, it does like, it kind of forms, informs the decision about which team you're hired in. You have to prove kind of the basics, just like as any other applicant, but it might actually form an advantage. And certainly people that have come into our teams have been very, very, like, that very diverse backgrounds, um, very, very also diverse backgrounds also in terms of age and experience. And it does, uh, it, it is being considered, it is uh, uh, something that is valued very highly. Like, I've always had kind of also questions about, like, if you've actually spent a long time on your research, your postdocs, and everything. Um, it does also, like you've, you're bringing a lot of maturity in terms of having research uh, uh, topics, having built out kind of like a research plan, finding areas basically that you're working in. Like mm -hmm. you're bringing a lot of experience to that role that will still be able to be translatable. I think the only thing is that you probably might realize is that you're starting out at the same, like your, start, your entrance level is, might even be the same as somebody who comes in with a master's level. So that is, uh, is, is, is probably, sometimes you're not actually might be able to make that jump to, the, to a slightly more senior role. So you might be still starting at the same level, but you might be actually advancing even much mm -hmm. faster through the company. So it might actually turn out to be an advantage uh, overall just by the experiences and kind of that you, that you bring in. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yeah, one back there. Nobody's throwing the basket. Yeah, you just <laughs> toss it. <laughs> Everyone's very careful. Uh, thank you. Um, this is a question particular to, uh, sorry, uh, name, uh, <laughs> Alexander. <laughs> yeah. okay. I, uh, I'm curious about finding work in some type of machine learning research or deep learning in particular. And I'm curious about what types of courses you could look to do online to specifically get into that field, or types of resources you can use beforehand to better prepare your resume, your interview, everything to try and find a job in that field. Yeah, uh, maybe I can tell you a little bit again about the path that I took. Um, I think there are even more resources now. So I think it's great to start pretty basic, and it might be very easy, I suspect it will be for everyone in this room to go through like, I don't know, an intro to machine learning course on Coursera or something. But I really recommend starting there um, before going straight into some hot deep learning course online or something like that. Just because um, you want from the beginning to try and build out a little bit more breadth of knowledge instead of just knowing neural networks. Like if I asked you an interview about, I don't know, Bayesian non-parametrics or something, I'd want you to be able to have at least a high level conversation about it. Um, and sort of just starting from the beginning and getting a sense of the wider field of machine learning, I think is the right way to start. Um, doing some of those online uh, deep learning courses, not a bad idea as well. Uh, as I said earlier, do the coursework at every step. Um, uh, and 
Yeah, it's really, I, for me at least, I'm always looking for projects. Like ideally, obviously, for a researcher role in particular, papers are great, um, but not everyone is going to be able to have the support or the time to make a, a paper happen, but um, maybe you can embed machine learning into some work that you're doing. Uh, that might not be obvious at first, but once you start to know more, you might begin to see some opportunities. Um, maybe it's going to be a Kaggle competition. Um, in terms of getting access to GPUs, I know that can be tough. Um, I actually started by using my own home desktop, uh, originally built as a gaming PC, but uh, it turns out NVIDIA GPUs, uh, even the smaller ones can run, uh, at least the modern ones can run uh, the same CUDA um, accelerated library that uh, your several thousand dollar GPU might do. So you can consider looking for resources close to home. Google has something called uh, Collaboratory, which is sort of uh, a Jupyter notebook um, version of like a, a Google document that can also connect to uh, GPUs. Um, it's not going to be good for like really serious programming, but to like do your coursework for one of these online courses, I think that would be perfectly adequate. Um, uh, other random bits of advice. Uh, it can be really tempting to do everything in a really friendly, high-level language like Keras. But if you are serious about moving into uh, machine learning uh, for research or as a research engineer, I'd highly recommend looking at the more sort of underlying uh, lower level languages like PyTorch or TensorFlow. Sort of you should be able to implement um, in those kind of level of language um, uh, at least simple neural networks. Ideally, maybe read, be able to read a paper and implement something. Um, so I realized that was quite a long response, but I should say people can feel free to talk to me afterwards as well, and I can talk more about these kind of um, bits of your background. But it, it's sort of, it's always like doing the homework, um, reading widely, uh, getting plugged into machine learning Twitter actually was great for me. Um, uh, for some reason, machine learning as a community is very active on Twitter, um, which is great because uh, even though there are these, you know, I think we're at like 100 papers a day or something insane now. Um, but following the wisdom of crowds a little bit, you can at least see what the community is really excited about and try and read those papers. And uh, the, as soon as you've got some basic machine learning knowledge, you're going to start to be able to read those papers because usually they're being written for conferences instead of journals, which means, in my experience, they're much more readable than physics papers in terms of just like quickly reading through them because they don't have to be quite as compressed. <laughs> um, uh, and yeah, just getting into that habit. Like I was reading a, a, a paper on the train every morning, basically, that kind of thing. Um, and trying not to just read the one thing you need for the project you're doing, reading about a bunch of different fields. Um, there are also a bunch of really good machine learning podcasts out there. Um, Talking Machines is a favorite one of mine, but there are a bunch of them. Um, it'll probably start out a little bit too advanced for you, and once you're a little bit deeper in, it'll be too simple for you, but it will still be a great way to introduce you to, again, a, sort of a wider range of machine learning instead of just, I don't know, very deep neural networks. Um, yeah. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, we've talked a bit about the demonstrating in the interview the, you know, the technical skills, but we also heard this morning that one thing people sort of assume about physicists or have seen in their experience is that they lack collaboration skills, they lack leadership skills. What are some things that one can try to show in the uh, interview to try to dispel that myth based on maybe a typical student's or postdoc's experience? Anybody want to try? Well, I think that when you are writing a paper and you have collaborators, even if it is your supervisor, that is an, that is an environment like a possibility to actually show that you can collaborate with people, even if it is your supervisor, if you have examples of collaborating with people at your same level, so other PhD students or even a postdoc, um, that is also a great example to show that you can work in teams. Maybe have a few like stories around those areas that then you can like reshape and like in any questions they might ask you about like team building, if that's your best example of team building. And I will say if you're a postdoc, or even as, as a PhD, if you have the possibility to work with an undergrad student, like help them um, complete a project that shows your leadership, like that you can manage someone. So there's many, even though you're doing your PhD or your master's, there might be things that you have already done to build those little skills. Perhaps it's not like being the leader of your soccer club that could also work. But 
helping an undergrad with a project is a great uh, leadership example. Like, even if you go to the TA level, like managing 30 students in front of a class and like uh, helping them learn, that could also work as an example. As soon as you start like looking through your history of the things that you've done, you realize that you have way more leadership examples or managing examples that you might know as of now. So sit down like a couple of hours and think all the little things that you've done and how can you like bucket them into leadership management, like soft skills, uh, hard skills, and then build stories around that that are compelling and that someone um, will find interesting. Again, do not use those stories, your first version of those stories in an interview, like practice them with a friend or that can criticize them and make them better. And don't assume that the interviewer, Dean, as you both mentioned, your interviewer may not be a physicist. If they are, great. But even if they are a physicist, they may not be familiar with the type of research environment you're coming from. Um, so don't assume that somebody says, oh, this person has a PhD in physics, so they were probably a TA. They probably know how to talk to students. They probably know how to organize things. They're not going to know that. So these are, are excellent points that you do have a lot of skills, whether you taught a tutorial, whether, you know, if you were an experimentalist and you helped somebody else build a piece of equipment, test a piece of equipment, you babysat their vacuum pump while they went out to dinner, whatever, you have these skills, figure out how to explain that to somebody who has no idea what a physics research background looks like. Um, again, yes, you're right, the soccer club, if, you're, if you help organize the summer picnic, that's team building, that's organizing, that's logistics. So th that's, that's excellent. And, and don't assume that people know all of these little things that are involved in getting a research uh, degree because you know, the typical hiring person has no idea who you are or what you do. So you do have to explain it to them. But you're right, run it past some people first because your vocabulary may not be very accessible. I would probably also echo one of Alexander's comments made earlier. If you're thinking about the technical questions that they're really just about solving a technical problem, that's probably not the case. A lot of times when we're, when we're trying to basically pose technical questions, they're pretty much about as much about knowing how you approach a problem, how you communicate it. Like in some cases, basically, the, the question might even try to push you a bit to the edge and put you a bit under pressure and see how you how you collaborate, how do you ask questions, how do you try to come up to the solution mm -hmm. rather than uh, just solving the problem perfectly. That's really not the idea. The idea really is to establish that dialogue and kind of show that you can make it to the problem, that you can ask the right questions, that you can build a dialogue and build kind of that interaction between whoever is in the room and that you can kind of ask counter questions, maybe get the, get the right hints to basically help you solve the problem and doing that under a slightly like a high pressure uh, situation, I think shows a lot about your kind of communication, your interaction, your collaboration skills as well. And I think that's pretty much this, what, so the technical interview is not just about solving the technical, it's about all of the other aspects as well. And you might walk out of an interview that might just have had technical questions and you might have even like felt that you didn't do well on some of them. That might not be the case. It depends on how you've approached it, how you've communicated in the interview. So focus on that as much. Yeah. That's something you can practice. You can totally ask a friend or yeah. a friend of a friend to help you by giving you an interview. Um, and that is incredibly awkward, but very valuable because they will tell you like, uh, hey, Alex, you didn't talk for 10 minutes. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> so um, I, I highly, highly recommend that. And I also recommend looking for leadership opportunities during your PhD or postdoc. Maybe you can volunteer to help organize a workshop or be on, I'm sure Vector has some like graduate student association or something that you can volunteer for. Uh, like ways to be involved in your community and to sort of demonstrate that. Uh, or maybe it's even just like an open source project. Maybe there's some cool uh, implementation of some uh, next leading order calculation uh, package that you can contribute to and be like, hey, I'm part of this online community. Look at all these pull requests and these comments that I put on other people's um, contributions and stuff like that.
So sort of look for those opportunities as well. Like, um, obviously, you probably already have a bunch of them, but if you're a year or two away from leaving physics, you might as well look for a few cool ones to add to your resume. Mm -hmm. That's good. Any other questions? OK. Well, maybe um, just to wrap up, we'll kind of go through, uh, give a chance of each of you to make some closing remarks. Maybe think back to when you were a, a student or a postdoc, and what is maybe something that you wish you could tell that younger self? Maybe it's a word of reassurance or maybe some further advice um, that maybe you haven't had a chance to share today. Maybe we'll start at this end. And I, I guess the biggest piece of advice I will give is that make some time to think of all the opportunities you have available. Like, we are like a very small sample of physicists that want to do very different broad things. And as us, there's many people doing many, many cool different stuff. So there's many different things you can end up doing. So take some time to consider those possibilities. Is it something that excites you or not? Is it like a postdoc, something that excites you, excites you or not? And it, the question at the end is like, I would love to be a postdoc. Like by all means, that, that's what you should be doing. But do not, I will say that the advice I would give to me in the past is like, take the moment of considering what you want to do with your physics degree with less pressure of not following the academia track. Like, you have a ton of opportunities. You have skills that are very versatile. Consider the opportunities that, that you might have open to you, and don't be afraid to pursue them. Like, it can be a lot of fun. It can be very rewarding. So take the time to think and, and, and explore different paths. And I think that's some advantage that we have of our versatile education, is that we can actually pursue those, and we, can, and we have the skills to achieve those goals. So give yourself the chance to, to explore and to decide what you want to do, and it can be super fun. I would agree. And I'm, I'm thinking of the bullet point that was in the, the top left corner of one of the slides this morning about understanding yourself and fighting against the perceived wisdom of, you know, this is the, the default path. There is nothing. Not only is there nothing wrong, there is much to celebrate in figuring out what you like, what makes you happy. Don't follow a path because somebody else tells you you should, because you only get one kick at the can. So choose the path that will make you happy in life, and you'll make mistakes. You'll try something and go, oh, I didn't like that. That's OK. You can try something else. There's not just one path. So exactly, stop, think about it. You have a lot of options. Um, explore them, try them, and find out what makes you happy because you have the tools to build the life that will make you happy. You, can, you have many paths to choose from. Choose the one that you want to choose. And it takes time to kind of find your passion again. Yes. It, it's, it doesn't come overnight, and it doesn't come in a few months. And I think the longest time, I think, that it, to the question about finding a job, it, it does take the time to kind of refine your passion is probably the longest part of the kind of journey to find of a different career path or a different direction. Um, and you, it really is very critical to find uh, the area that you really find something that you really can kind of like dig deep into, uh, something that gets you interested, something that gets you excited, that it kind of is the right match. Because you're going to perform a lot better and you're going to kind of like outpace your career and kind of like build a new career on that uh, when, you're, when there's areas and things that you can get really excited about and really passionate about and that are really matched to what you're interested in and the impact that you want to have. And kind of finding that does take time. It might take a year, it might take two years, it might take three years even, uh, to kind of, kind of find yourself a little bit and kind of reorient yourself. Um, but it is really worth it. Yeah, uh, there are a few things. I guess one thing is, um, I don't think research and preparing for something that isn't straight research is something that have, they don't have to be in conflict with one another, right? They can work together. Particularly if you start early thinking about these things, it may be as simple as 
hey, I'm going to start doing this project in Python instead of C++, or I'm finally going to start keeping a good GitHub repository for this project. Um, little things like that, which um, you probably should be doing anyway, but uh, will help you one day to actually get a job. Um, so I think that's probably like the, the most important thing, like start early, actually like do the, I keep on saying do the homework, like your teacher or something, but do the homework uh, and uh, you know, uh, reach out and talk to people. Um, like get, talk to your cousin who works at Google or your friend from grad school who's in a finance company now. Like get a sense of what it is that they do and think about like how you would feel uh, if that was your, your life. Like uh, for me, part of what told me I didn't want to be a particle physics professor was thinking about my friends who were professors and what their life was like. <laughs> uh, for me at least, uh, I didn't find it appealing at all. Um, there was a lot of teaching, teaching like pre-meds, God. And uh, you know, uh, <laughs> constantly trying to get grants and stuff like that. And for some people, that's fine. They love teaching, even, even pre-meds. And they, uh, they don't really mind uh, writing 10-page documents only to be told their research is meaningless. Um, but you know, just like try and think through like living in that role, um, not just like the TV version of a professor, right, or the TV version of a banker or whatever. Like what the actual day to day looks like, and whether that's what will make you actually happy. Great. Um, so in our lunch session uh, coming up in a little bit, you'll have the chance to talk further uh, with the panelists and uh, drill in on some of those questions that you may. Um, have or didn't have a, that we didn't have a chance to cover today. Um, let's thank all of our panelists um, before we move on to um, hearing from Aggie. Great, thank you.